forearm. It's not an elbow joint action, it's a forearm action. This is the medial view so that we would have a ligament going across here called the ulnar collateral ligament. Okay, I guess that's about it uh, for what we need. And oops, lateral view, we're just going to look at the outside where we see the head of the radius bone sitting here, the lateral epicondyle. I, bring, I, I like to put in uh, the radius bone because uh, um, bone chips. Now obviously banging the electronic process into the fossa can cause bone chips as well. I mean, bone chips are actually highly cartilage chips where they break away part of the bone and the osteoblasts that uh, regrow bone in your body continually as a result of stress or in the growing process will go through those openings. The hyaline cartilage is what in, keeps it from growing on. So when there's a hole in it, it grows through and they call those bone spurs. And you got to get them removed because it's not going to, the bone opposite it that articulates with it's not going to like that spur jabbing into it. So we don't want to break away pieces of the hyaline cartilage. We've got to stop banging those bones in the back of the elbow together. Uh, but we also have a severe problem that people don't recognize, they haven't said much about and that is the rebound of the head of the humerus bone into the, uh, uh, the trochlea. And you can break away a piece of hyaline cartilage there as well, and that can uh, create uh, spurs. I had a pitcher come to me that was, he would pitch and he'd be in great pain, pitch and be in great pain, and uh, I looked at him and I said, you got a spur. And so he went to the doctor, the doctor he came back, he said, the doctor said he didn't. I said, well, make sure that he looks between the head of the radius bone and the capitulum <clears throat> went back and he found the spur. They're just not used to looking for it in that uh, compartment of the elbow. So that's, that's the reason why I put this up here. We can't, we can't forget the other uh, serious injury. In fact, uh, if, you, if you read some of uh, Dr. Joel Adams' work in 1960s where he was uh, studying the, the uh, youth baseball pitchers in San Bernardino, California, he took X, he was an orthopedic surgeon, took x-rays of all the kids involved in their youth program and, um, uh, and, and treated other injuries. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a report that if you're interested in the effects of youth baseball pitching on the arms, you, you should read. But he had a kid come to them, couldn't straighten his arm, they had to remove the head of the radius in order to give him range of motion back. That's how bad that pounding during adolescence can be. It can just completely destroy the head of the uh, radius bone. I have that, I know for sure. In my, in my video that, uh, that I have online of my uh, baseball pitch instructional video. Okay, answering the question, why did we lose the, uh, the flexion range of motion? This is a brachialis muscle, the pure flexor of the elbow, the pure. The bicep brachia is not a pure flexor of the elbow. It's a shoulder joint flexor. It's a, they call it an elbow flexor, but it doesn't attach. It attaches to, uh, uh, you know, to the shoulder and attaches to the, uh, to the radius bone with a, a fascial layer that goes to the ulnar bone. But this is the pure flexor. This is the one that, that does most of the work. It attaches to the coronary process. Okay, the coronary process enlarged. Got it? The reason that I lost the range of motion, my flexion range of motion, is when I pitched, I used the brachialis muscle to prevent my arm from extending outward. You would probably call it an eccentric muscle action kind of thing, where the force is not I mean, it appears as though I'm extending my arm, but in actuality, the muscle that's contracting is a muscle that flexes the arm, but the stress is greater, and so the arm goes out. And that constant pull is what caused my coronary process to enlarge. I don't know how that worked for you, but that was the cause. The solution, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, while I still have this here, before I put on that uh, video, um, we need to uh, visit <coughs> some other muscles because I'll be mentioning them. This is a pronator teres. Pronator teres attaches. <laughs> I'll get smarter. 
attaches to the medial epicondyle on the supracondylar ridge, and then it comes down and attaches to the middle of the uh, uh, lateral side of the radius bone. So it comes off of here, goes down to there. All right? When it contracts, it turns the thumb or, or rotates the radius bone closer to the ulnar bone, which turns the thumb down. If it goes the other way, that action is called supination. This is pronation, hence the name pronator teres. Very powerful muscle, a critical baseball pitching muscle. <clears throat> I'm getting ahead of myself now, but when I realized how important pronation was for baseball pitching, and I realized that I, I used the brachialis muscle to flex the elbow to protect it, I came to one other realization, and that is because the pronator teres muscle attaches above the elbow joint, it is also an elbow joint flexor. I could use a pronator teres to flex the elbow and prevent the bones in the back of the elbow from banging. And a little test, you get this participation here. Everybody gets to have a little fun. Don't do it hard to don't want you to hurt yourself. But if you take your hand this way and you go out and keep that thumb up, you'll feel the bones in the back of your elbow bang together. And if you do it hard enough, you won't like it. Now, watch this. I'm going to put it out there as hard as I can, but when I do, I'm going to turn my thumb down. Watch. Hard as I can do it. Won't hurt. Why won't it hurt? Because the pronator teres muscle is flexing the elbow, which prevents the bones in the back of your elbow from banging together. Got it? So now you're going to coach pitchers. Are you going to teach them to supinate to release their curveball and bang their elbow? Or are you going to teach them to pronate to release their curveball and not bang their elbow? No, nope. the curveball is supposed to be dangerous to throw at all ages, right? And indeed it is, if you supinate. But if you pronate, it is not dangerous at any age. All right? Got that? How many major league pitching coaches you think know that? That many. That's why they destroy the pitching arms of major league pitchers. That's why they're on the disabled list all the time. Coaches have no idea what they're doing. <coughs> That's because kinesiologists didn't teach it. Kinesiologists are supposed to know this stuff. That's what we exist to know. Uh, oh, I went back to break down. That's what I went to. Put that over there. Oh, I put, I put the one I want to show next over here. And not, that was, you know. I want to show a little Tisma story. Uh, let's see, where do I have the label? There it is, upside down and back. Tismus dorsi. What an amazing muscle. What do you think the Tismus dorsi does? Helps your poles? Has nothing to do with that. That's the serratus anterior. The serratus anterior pulling the, the scapula around the side of the body, and people call that the Tismus dorsi. It's not, has nothing to do with that. The Tismus dorsi attaches, look at this. What bone is this? This is the iliac crest. That's your hip bone. You got a muscle that attaches to your arm, major dorsi major, attaches on the inside of the bicipital groove. Protect pectoralis major is outside the bicipital groove, the tismus dorsi, and then the teres major, major dorsi major. It attaches to the bicipital groove, which is on the anterior surface of the head of the humerus bone. It attaches all the way up to what level is that? T10. Tenth thoracic vertebrae. Amazing. What a muscle. It's huge. Laying across the entire lower back. How many major league pitchers do you think use that muscle in helping them pitch? Zero. It is the most powerful muscle that attaches to the arm, and they use it zero, not at all. Does that make any sense to anybody? You want big muscles applying force, don't you? I, at least that's the way I always worked at it. Now, I'm supposed to have one more x-ray, or one more overhead here. What did I do with it? Maybe, maybe I forgot to put it in. I hope not. But you all know what it is, so I probably don't need to show it. But I always like to show it on anyway. You know, I don't seem to have it. Is there another one there? Is it uh, it's a tricep brachii muscle. <laughs> If the brachialis muscle is what's working when you're a baseball pitcher, 
and we'll show you when it's working and why it's working, how much are you using the tricep brachii muscle? You ever heard of co-contraction? Co-contraction, that's contracting antagonistic muscle simultaneously. There's a co-contraction, bicep, tricep. Bicep trying to flex, tricep trying to, uh, to extend. How much movement am I getting? None. None. If, I, if I extend, we got a reciprocal inhibition that stops my bicep from contracting. If I flex, I get the reciprocal inhibition because I got movement, and you can't move with antagonistic muscle under tension unless you want to tear it, such as when you pull the short head of the bicep from Morris. It's still contracted when you bring in the, the quadriceps groups. For those that want to understand why you pull a hamstring. Okay? So, <coughs> traditional baseball pitchers don't use the tricep brachia muscle to apply force to their pitches. What muscle in the arm has the highest percentage of fat switch muscle fibers? Tricep brachii. Major league pitchers don't use the latissimus dorsi, which is big and powerful, don't use the tricep muscle. They talk about a kinetic, you ever heard of kinetic chain? Anybody? Kinetic chain means that every joint of your body applies force in series to get the end result. And they talk about the traditional baseball pitching motion as though it is a perfect kinetic chain when we just found out that it doesn't use the elbow at all. It doesn't extend the elbow at all. Well, that sort of breaks that kinetic chain, doesn't it? There's no kinetic chain once you don't use one, one joint, and certainly one as critical as the pitching elbow, in, the, in applying force. So the traditional baseball pitching did not have a, a kinetic chain. But it can be done. You just have to teach people how to use the tricep on muscle. And so we're going to figure out how to do that. And uh, that, that, that little bitty thingy uh, is going to show it. So let me do that now. I'll turn this off. I think we're, we're primed to understand what we're going to get out of this uh, video. Now the problem is, will I be able to see the right button and then use it correctly? Old age, what was it? It's not for sissies. That's a quote from uh, Betty Davis. I think it's right. Oh, where's everybody? Where's everybody? I think that's the one. Is there anything on? I think you got yeah, something on. Oh, you get power up. Yeah, okay. the ball warm up here. Well, I'll fill it with the coat. <laughs> I'm going to show you here just how horrible traditional baseball pitching motion is, not, not only for the injurious flaws, but in terms of a kinesiologically perfectly designed force application technique. That's, that's what we are. As kinesiologists, we're applied anatomists and we're biomechanists. We have to understand the science, uh, especially, as I said, Newton's three laws of motion, but we have to understand the muscles. You can't do one without the other and design a perfect way to apply force. And that's what we want to do. That's our job. I've always looked at the athletic fields as the laboratory for the kinesiology class. We are supposed to figure out the best way for athletes to get the most out of what they have uh, in their performances. And the best way to apply force is part of what we have here. And the most difficult part of being a scientist is uh, stopping what you think you know and only believing what you can prove. It was my difficulty too because I taught all my life. Sorry. I'll just zoom out. Oh, we see it. We're working on the DVD. Working on that. Oh yeah, we had to go down to uh, video. I think it was. I don't know if that. I already did. Did that and it didn't work. I didn't know. I just saw the girl before doing it. I paid attention to it. Is that turned on? Oh, it's on VCR. Oh, okay. That's what happened. Oh, thank you. Always to the restroom. That's why, that's why we have smart people around. Then they're going to Actually, my wife has a program, everything, DVD and so on. Oh, yeah, and we're ready to go. There you go. Then I got paused here. This is me back in 1967. This is when I took this. This is a max line fastball, which means a fastball that moves to the pitching arm side. We're going to watch this without stopping, but I just stopped it. I want to stop it before. Uh, so here we go. This is 60 frames a second. There's the best camera I could find. I found a 60 frame and a 400 frame from the agriculture engineering department. Let's watch this pitch. Oh, you just press pause again and uh, close, or I got to press play. 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 play again. Okay. Yes, there you go. Now, to a lot of people, that really.